I'd like to start by giving everybody, as we segue into the conversation, just a little bit of the background uh, behind the note in case you weren't already aware. Uh, in my eyes, the note is uh, considered a rock star, or a rock star equivalent in Silicon Valley, just based on his work in the startup space and old Southern venture capital. Uh, after graduating from IIT Delhi with a degree in electrical engineering and then coming uh, stateside to CMU for the master's and then MBA uh, at Stanford here at the GSD, uh, you started a number of startups, and most prominent of which was Sun Microsystems, uh, which was a behemoth of the industry in the 80s and 90s, and afterwards you continued to work, uh, but this time in the venture capital space at Kleiner Perkins, where um, you seeded a number of different companies that had an outsized impact against the industrial uh, monopolies at the time in tech. Uh, and now the node leads Coastal Ventures, uh, which is a very renowned VC in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and something that stands out to me about your firm, which we'll get to in a second, is the mission values that you stand by uh, and, and some of your uh, very successful investments of the time. Uh, but to begin with, I'd like to start with a very broad question. Uh, and it's about just the concept of entrepreneurship, what made you excited about it, and what your first business was. So, I was sort of a young teenager in India, and I read a very old magazine in India back in the 60s, late early 70s. You'd get two-year-old magazines show up that you could rent to read. So I always rented these magazines. And I saw an article on any growth starting income in a magazine called Electronic Engineering Times. Uh, I was a nerd, so I read Electronic Engineering Times in India. Uh, uh, by the way, at the time when we had no TV, I, I had no TV at home or a telephone at home. So it was sort of the exact opposite word of a semiconductor startup reading about it. But I immediately said to myself, if Andy Grove, who was a Hungarian immigrant, could start a startup in the valley, and a cool technology startup, I didn't know what it meant, to have to make checks. But if he can do that, so can I, and I fell in love with the idea. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, the important thing is role models make a huge difference in motivation. And they keep you going when things go, get really, really hard. Uh, there's a, a presentation on entrepreneurship on our website that's called the Entrepreneurial Roller Coaster. Where the highs are high and the lows are low. By the way, I did that presentation long before there was um, laptops. I did it in overhead slides in 1986. Uh, so long, long time ago, it's 95% still relevant today. So the fundamentals of entrepreneurship don't change. But the point I was making is the subtitle was where the highs are high in the roller coaster and the lows are low. And when the low comes, normal people give up. Entrepreneurs look to their role model and say, that was done, and keep going. And they've powered through on a religious belief in what they're doing. And that's really critical to entrepreneurship. These are cultural factors, they're not skills per se, they're cultural factors, um, and, and that makes a huge difference. Okay, so you come to the Valley then with this notion that you want to build something, and and after graduating from the GSD, you found Daisy Systems, which is which in its own right uh, was a pretty successful company at the time and had a valuation at one point in tens of millions of dollars. But I think more than that because it went public. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, after that also comes Sun Microsystems, and that's, you know, a multi-billion dollar company with many famous innovations that, that have affected you know, where we are today. And, and so my question for you comes down to this difference between a million dollar company and like a billion dollar company and how Daisy Systems might have influenced then uh, Sun Microsystems. So, uh, you know, I've talked about the difference between a zero million dollar company and a zero billion dollar company, but it wasn't so much to do with Daisy Systems. It's today, when you start, you think about the problem differently. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're a zero million dollar company and a zero billion dollar company. And most of your thinking is how ambitious are you? 
you don't say, how do I get to 10 million or 100 million in revenue, but you sort of ask, what would it take to uh, get to 10 billion in revenue or a billion dollars in revenue, and then work backwards to say, what's my first step in step? Uh, the analogy uh, I give people, and I'll come back to, and remind me if I forget, how to make this difference when you're starting, when you're two people in a shop. And I'll give you some analogy. But if you are trying to ascend Mount Everest, nobody got to Mount Everest without getting to base camp first, and then camp one, camp two, camp three, and then the final ascent. But here's the difference, critical difference. If you're going to Mount Everest, you go to 14,000 feet at base camp. You don't try and get to 16,000 feet on some other peak that doesn't lead to Mount Everest. So you can shoot for less initially because it leads to a more ambitious path later. And that's really, really critical. To think about the long-term path and, in fact, do less short-term. And I can give you lots and lots of examples. But in the case of Sun, go back to that. You know, building a, a, a workstation, and by the way, Sun Microsystems initially was called Sun Workstations, because, and then we got more ambitious and started to rename it Microsystems, with the idea that it'd be all of computing, not just a workstation. Uh, but we bought a pool of units, and we were running the machine. And people said, great, now we don't have to staff that because we are buying a pool of units. And I said, no, we're going to recruit Ben George because the larger vision is about distributed computing and NFS and things that weren't in Unix now. In fact, nobody cared about distributed computing. In fact, the most common request I got early on to is to delete networking from Suns and use it as a time-shared multi-user machine because that was the standard factor. You know, DEC machines and PDB machines were all time-shared systems. And so nobody thought of any value to networking, but we insisted on putting it in every machine. By the way, it was the first machine in 1982 had hardware encryption because I figured if you do networking, you'd need encryption and security, which nobody ever used. But the vision was large. More importantly, I went and recruited Bill Joy, um, Andy Bechtelstein first, and he had offered me a full license to the Sun technology for 10,000, and I said, I don't want the golden egg you've just laid, I want the goose that laid it, so I want you on board. And then did the same with Ben Joy, because we figured there was a decade of software evolution to come, not just building a machine that we could sell. And that's very different kinds of thinking. So I gave up about half my equity to Andy. Why? Because future generations would be important, not just the product you were selling. So, Principally, the difference between a zero million and a zero billion dollar company is the way you think about what you're doing and willing to compromise short-term progress for longer term picking the right path to Mount Everest, not just to 16,000 feet, and building the team in the right way. Most of it shows up in the way you think about the team you're building. Let's, let's talk about that. So the most common thing I get is, hey, I'm doing this, I can just contract this out to a couple of engineers and get this done. And that's okay, but you're not setting up the gene pool for where you want to go in five and 10 years. Well, what is the hallmark of a good team for a startup? Well, it, there's no generic answer here. It's different in each situation, but it's thinking about the risks you will face in five years and 10 years, and say, let me get the team that can ask those questions very early. Asking the right question, thinking from first principles, which I referred to earlier, that's what's critical about getting to that five-year point. So let me pick
take the example of my son who graduated from computer science department here five, five years ago or so. Uh, we decided, he decided he built a primary care doc based on AI. Now the first instance of the primary care service, and if you built an AI doc, you wouldn't be licensed to practice because the FDA would regulate it. And almost everybody who did primary care, and this may not still work, essentially said, we'll put docs on software and telemedicine, and they'll consult with patients. Mm -hmm. That's a dead end street. It doesn't go anywhere. My son decided they do it over chat, and they build an architecture where every chat message would be a learning event. Every single text message would be a learning event for the AI. Way harder. You get no product for three or four years. You're doing development, you're developing technology, and no revenue, while everybody else is grabbing revenue. Right? Um, it's taking a long time, and it still may not be successful. Yeah. And he had to hire people, almost every one of whom was making seven-digit salaries at Google or some Netflix or someplace else. And so it was hugely expensive on the equity. Now, under my advice, he made those trade-offs. And I think he's better positioned today than almost anybody else building broad primary care. But he has far less revenue, far less nominal progress to show. But I think he has the right base there. Like, that's a good example and a recent one. So, um, Going off of that note on like risk taking and going against the grain of like immediate profits, things like that. Um, but when you look at companies that you advise, in Kyler Perkins and also at Coastal Ventures, um, were there any, I guess, shared traits among founders uh, that were like successful in their endeavors that stood out to you? And um, yeah, what about that? So good founders first are very persistent because startups are really hard. You know, they sound romantic when you read about them in the press, but they're really hard. They're really down dead. How many people here have been on it? No. Raise your hands. So you know what I'm talking about. It is hard. And it's not as romantic as you know reading the stories uh, you see in uh, medium or tech crunch in your favorite publication. Um, so there's this persistence and belief in their what they're doing that lets them power through some really hard times. There's also very broad thinking. Founders who have fairly rigid views don't generally succeed because most success looks nothing like the plan you originally got. And hence, I have another popular tweet that gets retweeted a lot. The team you build is the company you build, not the plan you make. Because the team helps you evolve the plan. When you're starting, there's a lot of things you don't know. The right team helps you figure out the right questions to ask and keep iterating and changing and pivoting. And is honest enough you say when some things aren't working, to admit it early. The earlier you admit it, the sooner you can change it. Uh, so a good founder takes a lot of input, but then doesn't follow all the input, but uses it in their thinking from first principles about defining when to change, when to not, when to stick with it, when to be bullheaded versus when to be really flexible and iterate. Uh, there's a great article on our website written by a professor at a French business school. Um, and he basically describes this process of founders are pretty obstinate about their vision, but really flexible about their tactics. And so I look at the analogy of you're trying to cross the street, you're pretty clear you want to get to the other side but it's almost never a straight path. 
your stepping stones may be zigging and zagging, and that's what good startups do. They're really flexible about zigging and zagging, but not at the expense of losing focus on the large vision. It's a hard process to describe. And this paper by this French professor defines how entrepreneurs sort of get to the next stepping stone and gather the resources there for the next step, and then the next step. And every time you step a little further, you get a little more access to resources that seem unfathomable. So if you're sitting here in your Elon Musk and saying, I'm building a car company and I need $5 billion, it's not going to happen. Um, but if you sort of say, what are the stepping stones and what can I gather in resources as I gain credibility with investors and employees and others, that's sort of a very iterative process. And building the right team and being open-minded of input from the team is really, really valuable. There's a good book called Dare, uh, what's it called? Willful Ignorance by Margaret Heffern, a British author, on like encouraging differentiated thinking in your startup. She talks about it generally in all organizations, but I think especially to startups have to course correct very rapidly and quickly without being so quick to correct that they never focus on any one goal. It's a very hard process to describe, but having the right team who, which raises the right questions, and then having a process to really not get paralyzed by that, but make a decision based on that using first principles, and there's a lot of judgment calls and more moves. Was there a startup that stood out to you for taking those right steps and having that team that's flexible and needed to be the most? Almost every good startup is like that. You know, take Struck. Patrick Thorson dropped out of school, Patrick and John both dropped out of school. I think second year, if I'm not mistaken, of college. They didn't know him. They definitely didn't even know the word drink that. Right? They just wrote a little script. They built an awesome team under it, and they listened to it, and they knew when to ignore it. Right? And say, no, this is what we're doing, and we need to clear. So that balance, uh, I always say Stripe is a really good example of a company that did that. So let's talk about Coastal Ventures now, and um, if you could tell us a little bit about the mission goals behind your firm, and um, you know, if sticking in a to those principles has ever led to you maybe missing out on an opportunity because you know, yeah, so you have to be. So one of the things I said in 1986, what in that presentation I referred to is, you have to be clear what your goals are. In many, many different goals are okay for a start. Right? And I come back to for a West Venture. But I, if I vaguely remember a slide, you might it sort of said you might do a startup just because you want to work work with friends. You you know, and then you you're not trying to optimize revenue or the value, you're trying to work in the right environment. Perfectly good goal. Um, and back then, really good goal if you just want to be happy <laughs> and you're not overly ambitious. It could be, uh, I remember one of the lines was never having to carry the American Express stuff. You don't want to be famous. Or you, or you want to be famous and that's why you're doing the startup. And there's plenty of founders who've done that. Or never having to balance your checkbook. That's a strictly financial goal. So there's many, many goals possible. And you have to be clear why you're doing your startup. You may have passion for a mission. I personally like that goal the most. And that comes back to coastal ventures. We are not trying to maximize returns or have the largest fund like some of the funds are doing. We want to work on really interesting technology-based problems that have large impact. It's very simple. We'll take on much harder paths. But my son said, it's not way easier to make money without having this long-term ambition. But the goal is very simple. If he's successful, 
all 7 billion people in the planet and have free primary care 24 7. Now, and I said since he didn't have to balance the checkbook or pay his mortgage, this was a good goal to chase. You have the freedom to chase that goal, and not everybody does. They have to support family and other things. So this is why being sure what your goals are so important. At Costa Ventures, you know, our focus is in technology-driven societal impact. And so uh, I'm 67, so after I turned 60, I said, most people I know, and I had my business school reunion not very far from here, and everybody was talking about retirement or golf or sailing or something. And I said, what do I want to do? Like, you know, all those things feel like end of life. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to transition into relaxing. Um, so, I took a month off, did a lot of thinking and research, and wrote a 50-page document called Reinventing Society Infrastructure with Technology. And the proposition was very simple. You know, pick a hard problem. Oh, this chip keeps me moving. Uh, pick a hard problem that most people think is not solvable and be fun to work at. You know, why do people climb Mount Everest? Because it's there, right? And if you can have great impact, then that's double value. And I was very interested in climate from a long time ago. And I said, 700 million people, this was about five or six years ago, on the planet have a rich lifestyle. That means rich in healthcare, rich in housing, rich in transportation, the kinds of cars they buy, rich in education. Rich in health, access to health care, rich in entertainment. In every way, a rich lifestyle. And that's probably 10% of the planet. 700 million people, but 7 million people want it. And I urge all of you to think about these things. I said, if we, I know that 7 billion people can't get the same lifestyle by having 10 times more steel, 10 times more cement, 10 times more agriculture, 10 times more. It's not possible. That math doesn't work. And so I said it'd be really fun to work on 10x the amount of goods and services produced in each of these areas without 10x the resources. I looked at the problem of India. And I looked at healthcare and said to get the same doctor-patient ratio. If I had a trillion dollars, in 30 years, I couldn't come up with a way with a trillion dollars, which doesn't exist in India, to open enough medical schools, train enough professors, uh, to essentially go solve that, just get the level of healthcare in the US by changing the patient doctor ratio, ex doctors for every 100 patients. Uh, and so that was an interesting challenge. And that's not a resource intensive challenge, you, you know. 10 times the energy, that was a hard challenge also. So that's where I came up with the idea that AI is the only possible way, the only possible way, replace doctors with AI, and then you can scale medicine. Every, most people in India, even today, I've never see an oncologist if they get cancer. That's a shame. How do you solve that problem? Not by having a hundred fold more oncologists in India. I've actually never heard while growing up of anybody ever going to a psychiatrist. I didn't even know that was some specialty because anybody with mental, mental health problems got and didn't get access to any help. Sorry about that. Turn that off. Um, so, how do you scale it? Can everybody, whether they're in India or Africa or Latin America, get access to medicine? They get access to a tumor board, which, God forbid, if I have a cancer, I'll go to Craig Hutchinson or Memorial Sloan Kettering, probably three institutions where you get seven doctors on a tumor board for your tumor. 
that level of care to act in every village only possible through technology. And that's a hard problem, but it's entirely solvable. In fact, today I'm 100% convinced it's possible to do and dramatically improve the quality of medicine even if you had an oncologist or a cardiologist. So I wrote about this six, seven years ago. I said a village in India will have better cardiac care than at Stanford Hospital because we'll have humans at Stanford that won't have as much knowledge as the AI system delivered to the phone in a village in India. So that was an example. You know, at the other end, energy production. About five years ago, I helped get a, call, a fusion effort. Everybody said the first fusion reactor won't be built before 2050. And I said, what about by 2030? Uh, it's not 2050. And we are building it. And in three years or four years, we've made more progress than the $20 billion ITAR global project that's been funded with 20 billion so far. We've made more progress than them in three than they've done with 20 billion dollars in 25 years. We will prove fusion done, the goal is in the next three years, by 2025. Their goal is to prove proof of concept principle by 2035 and applying to it in the 2050s. We think we'll replace every coal and natural gas plant in this country first and then in the planet by 2040. Now, that's a whole different scale because it solves the climate crisis in a very different way. Now, we may fail at it, but I'd rather try and fail than fail to try. And almost everybody else in fusion is failing to try. So in the interest of time, uh, you know, there's a hundred pundits that can tell you why this can't be done, and they're like the people at Volkswagen and General Motors, who said electric cars will not happen. Five years ago, no major auto company had an electric car on their plants. Then Elon Musk alone proved that, Tesla proved that it not only can be built, consumers will want it, and you can build the networks. They told you all the reasons it can't be done, and my answer is skeptics never get that possible. Only entrepreneurs can do that possible. And it's, it's pretty exciting to hear about the different ventures. I get excited, so talking about it. I'll make it my voice. <laughs> Certainly. So one final question. By the way, that makes me feel a lot younger, so I now say I'm hex 43 in age. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who get that joke. So if you could, if you could do it. I no longer think of myself as 67. If you could do it all again, right, in today's day and age, you know, from college onwards, what steps would you take to have the impact that you want to see for yourself in today's world? Well, first, I think every person's different. And they shouldn't do what I did or I might want to do. Every person should say, here's what's important to me. Uh, and that would happen, that they should chase. Don't chase other people's strengths. So 95% of the people I know especially at this age, will end up following somebody else's dream for them. You should get this promotion, you should get this title, you should get this job, you should make this much money. Decide what's important to you internally. Be internally driven. When most people in society you will run into are driven by what others expect of them or what's expected of them by peers, parents, professors, you name it. Sure. That's probably the single most important message I can give you. And then, whatever you decide, you can change it five years later. If your goals change or your personality changes, and hopefully all of you will evolve over time. So it's okay to keep changing goals. Uh, that's probably the most important. And then, don't listen to the experts. The experts are almost always wrong. And that's why no single innovation, large innovation, in the last 40 years has come from somebody who knew it. Elon Musk had never been in hardware, let alone in the auto industry. You know, Jack Bezos had never been in retail. You know, the, the Airbnb folks had never done 
particular hotel in it. And the Uber guys had never done, um, you know, uh, uh, car rentals. Uh, no matter where you go, you look at the people who did completely changed media. It wasn't Fox and CBS and NBC or Rupert Murdoch. And he tried. I had many conversations with him before he bought MySpace. Most of you are too young. It was the first social network. <laughs> and he bought it in 2004, I think. Uh, but it was Twitter and Facebook and Netflix and YouTube. People didn't even know they were in the media business. So no matter where you look, the large generations come from thinking from first principles. And so don't get too swayed by what people tell you can can't be done. And that doesn't mean everything can be done. It means you have to think from first principles of how to get define those stepping stones, that base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four. And even if you don't have full visibility, and entrepreneurs have to be unusually comfortable with ambiguity and discomfort and sleepless nights and the churning stomach. And those of you who have been entrepreneurs probably know all this. You know, I've been through all of those nights, and I don't think any VC can advise you if they haven't found to building a company themselves. But really, the VCs understand how hard it is to be an entrepreneur. Right. They have no empathy for them, uh, what entrepreneurs go through. So you put this on a spreadsheet, uh, and are you performing to this plan? We have plans are irrelevant. I, you know, I will go to a board meeting and say, the plans are irrelevant, and other VCs look at me funny, and I say, don't plan, just plan to plan. And what that means is think about what is an important causal variable. Now, are you making progress somewhere? Whether you met the numbers plan, it was some number you had entered in the spreadsheet. So when I was raising money, and literally, I, I was even more arrogant back then, and, you know, I'd say to me, tell me what numbers you want, I'll change the variables, and then I'll give you a spreadsheet for those numbers. I'm fooling myself, I'm, you know, if you want to be fooled, I'll give you whatever plan you want. The fact is, I have no idea what to input into the spreadsheet that results in the output. You, plan on a 1% conversion rate or 2% or 3, that completely changes the plan. <coughs> and you have no clue. So you discover what, what the answers are, what are the key questions, what are the answers, and you make your plan less ambiguous over time. But people aren't comfortable with that, so ambiguity is another thing. Uh, sorry, I wondered, uh, I'll go back to uh, No, no, definitely very true and, and, and nice points. So thank you for that note. Uh, we'll now move on to the question and answer portion. We have Chloe, she has a mic, and she'll be going around uh, to each person um, as time permits uh, for different questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand up, and we'll try and come to you. Hi, Vinod, I'm Shanice. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is on Kosla Ventures and how you think of building and scaling investment talent, especially for a venture firm that has such a bold vision. Um, you know, it's weird. Talent is one of the hardest things to do. So, I would say we don't have a plan for this many partners, or we don't make firm plans. When we meet somebody with high potential, we'll hire them and hope they grow. And I also feel most people who join us should then leave after a while and go join a startup to learn that empathy thing I was talking about earlier. Most VCs have not earned the right to advise an entrepreneur. Very simple. Because they went to business school and because they joined a VC firm, give them no right to advise an entrepreneur. That's why if you Google 90% Google of VCs add no value and 70% add negative value, my name will pop up because I'm always uh, upsetting other VCs by saying it's stupid to advise people when you haven't built something yourself and don't know the mechanics, the dynamics inside a startup, what happens between three founders when things aren't going right and all the tensions pop up. And, you know, it's, it's the really hard stuff that you have to have an internal appreciation for. Uh, a lot of people who've gone and built things themselves, so that's a good sign. That's why I say you can join us. But 
go build a startup plan. And then you, first, your probability of building a successful startup will go up dramatically because you will, in time with us, you'll see all the mistakes other founders are making. Right? And all the discussions at the partnership of what's going right or wrong or what we think. That's really valuable in training. And then if you're an entrepreneur, you use all those things you learn to increase the probability of success. And then you probably qualify to be a VC. So that's sort of my philosophy. Going to be fair, you should probably walk over <laughs> next. Come in the whole room. Sorry, keep going. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kostan. Big fan. Um, Gulati, uh, really impressed by what you talked about. Um, I was really curious about uh, your early days at Sun and uh, KZ Systems, and what was your strategy in hiring and finding the best talent? You know, we didn't really have a strategy. First, you know, it's hard to remember 40 years ago. <laughs> I'll be honest. But I know we generally said any good person we found, we hired, whether we needed them or not. I'll give you an example. There was a guy called Rick Patel. He was a database expert at Xerox Corp. And I met him, really liked him. He was a real guru. We hired him. Some of the people said, you're not building databases. Why are you hiring a database person? I said, he's just a great thinker. Okay. And we hired him. And when you're doing a system, for those of you who are computer science geeks, like the network file system, your database knowledge starts to be valuable. Right? Because there's sort of file systems, databases, they are a country. But in those days, nobody even was thinking of a network file system. And I think the strategy at Sun evolved. And by the way, we started this idea of open source uh, because we open source network file system, the NFS works. Like, nobody had ever actually open sourced commercial product before that. And we just said, it'd be nice to get everybody working because it's too large a problem to work on alone. Uh, anyway, um, I'll keep my answer short, but it is, my strategy was any great talent. I still recommend that to all companies. Now I make sorry, man. <laughs> Thank you so much for your um, I have a question. If the U.S. and most innovative startup founders come from outside the industry, how do you recommend us as students to explore in a way so that we don't get pigeonholed into becoming an expert in a single industry and so we can stay open-minded and flexible? Yeah, so I think if you're in the, if you know something about an industry, you're better at identifying problems in that industry. So, First, if you don't know an industry you want to innovate in, hire people who know the industry, who can tell you everything that can go wrong. But when they tell you, and then this is how things are done, that's when you want to ignore them. Right? You want to identify the problem from people who know the industry. And, you know, Patrick and John at Stripe, they hire people who knew that area but they always made first principle decisions of their own. They didn't take the solutions of how things are done. Because experts can extrapolate the past into the future, not invent the future you want. And so understanding the problems from the past is very important, and I should minimize the value of people who know the industry in that sense. But when they start dictating the solution to that, they become incremental solutions not radical solutions. This is why there's a big difference between radical innovation and incremental innovation. But you know, knowing an industry is, is fine as long as you don't violate this. You're bringing all our experience. And experience is a bias. And you're trying to repeat something that bias is a very good thing because it prevents mistakes from happening. If you're trying to reinvent that area, that experience, that bias becomes a real handicap. And that's why people from an industry start. Can somebody think it that way? I hope they can. But it generally doesn't happen with super experienced people. 
I, uh, I'm Harshit Kohli and I study here at the GSD. Um, I want to say that your passion for radical innovation inspires me. And uh, I've been watching your videos on YouTube for over several years. But uh, you don't necessarily speak about your identity. And I want to know today from you how your uh, identity impacted your passion to innovate in the world. My identity yeah. relates yeah. to? Yeah. yeah. You know, look, this is back to what may, uh, ask, you know, you should ask what motivates you. Uh, I don't really care about the kind of car I drive, most people do. But I do want a nice car, but it doesn't have to be fancy. But what motivates me is intellectually thinking through problems and then trying to solve them. And the harder the problem, the more interesting it becomes. It's like taking on challenges. That's what motivates, that's what makes me happy. So I still, most weekends, will read scientific papers. It doesn't matter whether they're in CRISPR technology in biology or the latest diffusion model in AI. I'm a glutton for learning and trying to apply it to solutions. It's just what makes me happy. Way happier, if I would go watch a movie, I'm sitting there for two hours and saying, or oh, all the things I could be learning. <laughs> so I'm pretty impatient with going watching a movie. Um, so I'm very clear what my priorities are. Family is my highest priority. I love spending time there. My second thing is learning. <laughs> learning new things and then applying them. Uh, that's sort of my self-image of myself. So I sort of suggest you know, when you watch television, when you watch TV shows, whatever, look at people in the show. They're dressed a certain way, their hair is a certain way. One may be purple, one may be close, close cropped as a marine. Um, you know, look at the range and ask yourself the question, what does this person think of themselves? Essentially, the question you ask, what is their self-identity? And you'll be much better able to understand why they're doing one thing. Why does one person become a noble ship, I'm a marine sergeant, another person becomes uh, AOC on the left, and you know, every variant in between. A scientist, a football player, they all have self-identities and the way they think about themselves. And you know, television is a great place to watch these personalities and understand them, and recognize that different people are different. And they, they will, the world doesn't need all to be entrepreneurs or all to be a certain way. Thank you so much for being here. Mr. Doesn't like you, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is: Do you recollect any significant moments with Sun or other companies uh, where they could have died, or conversely, moments that created a huge inflection point for your success? Well, yeah, there's so many. Um, I couldn't even start to talk. There's like hundreds of them. And every company goes to this. Right? And literally I could take any example. But I'll tell you uh, why it's important to be introspective and ask a lot of questions. So there was a time in the late 80s, we started to do something called pen computing. You know, start using a pen to write on a tablet and have that not the keyboard as your principal interface. But we went through some pretty hard times and lost a lot of money. And at the end, I you know, I realized and both myself and John Doe were working on the same company together. I realized the pen wasn't the point. The company had a logo, the pen's the point, which is very clever, and fooled ourselves into believing that. What I 
realized towards the end, but the pen wasn't the point. Mobility was the point. And that little thing suddenly enabled the whole new style of thinking. So there are moments like that in every company if you're introspective about what you're trying to do. We had fooled ourselves with all the hubris about pen computing and the press started writing about it, and we started believing our own bullshit. So that's just one of a hundred examples I could give you. See, I embarrassed trying to you. My name is Zito. You mentioned first principle several times. Uh, I noticed that at Stanford, a lot of entrepreneur classes uh, teach you about uh, discovering customer needs and pain points. So it's kind of you try to find a problem and then try to find a uh, solution. What do you think of this approach uh, versus the other one is uh, you try to find the technology, uh, think from the first principle, get closer to new technology coming out of the lab. What do you think of these two approaches in terms of building a new Yeah, company? I think the business school approach is not really right. It's great for business. You know, retrospectively, if you have a mental model, you can find enough cases to fit it into. So always say anything random, and I'll find you five business school studies to fit that model. <laughs> uh, here's how I would answer your question and say don't pay too much attention. You know, you hear platitudes like technology looking for a problem, Clearly, that happens. But let me put it the following way. For technology-based startups, you really don't know when you're starting what a technology can do. So take my son's startup from building a primary care doctor. You don't know whether you can build an AI-based doc that doesn't need humans. You don't. Or how much can it do? And when? Is it two years? Then it's totally impractical. Is it 20 years? Then it's totally impractical. So I always say you sort of, it's an iterative cycle between playing with the technology, seeing what its capabilities are, and then seeing if it matches markets. So you sort of have to, I think you have to come at it <coughs> and not go do market research and define a problem, because the technology may not be able to solve a problem. And it matters how well it solves that problem. And, you know, old son story, we, you know, we thought at one point, hey, yes, almost all office correspondents were done on typewriters. How many people know what a typewriter is? Uh, enough, okay. But it was the only way to do things. And then laser printers came along, and it was a hard question to ask what resolution in dots per inch was enough to get people comfortable to do correspondence. Business correspondence this way, because the IBM selected typewriter was the gold stain. And turned out to be 300 dots per inch. But you didn't know what that number was, and you didn't know what cost effective laser printers could print at. And there was this iterative, and Adobe was started as a laser printing software company. That was in its entire business. Uh, when John Gornock uh, and Chuck Gatsky started that company. Uh, so, uh, I do think it's an important question. I do think you have to explore both ends. What capability can you develop in the technology and which markets can it address? And can you steer it in this zig and zag process I described towards the docking between the market needs and the technology capability? And we've been seeing that at Facebook, you know, with virtual reality. It's sort of been iterating from what the technology can do, what are the great applications, and so it's starting to finally meet. So this will also be our final question for today since we have to end at five. Why don't we go here? She's had a hand up for a while. I realize it's a bit of a run for Chloe, so... Um, my name is Cynthia, I'm a fellow uh, entrepreneur. It's great to see you from the cases to real life. Um, um, I did three interviews to end up at GSD here with three, three different years. I look at your bio, there is an, I feel there's an unspoken interesting story with how, how the, the line is, after two weeks in Carnegie Mellon, 
uh, got uh, strategically convinced to Stanford to give him an offer. He saw some of the so let me tell you a story because it's the essence of entrepreneurship. I didn't know it back then. I applied to Carnegie Mellon uh, from India to do biomedical, my master's degree in biomedical engineering, and then applied to business school at Stanford because I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had this dream to come to Silicon Valley, and Carnegie was just a stop in the way because they paid for my graduate education. I had no way to pay, so Carnegie was a good stop. And Stanford, of course, uh, rejected me. Well, that was fine. I argued with the admission director, not far from here, and said, what does it take for me to be accepted? And he said, two years of work experience. So I took him literally. I said, OK, I'll apply with two years of work experience. So I got two full-time jobs. <laughs> I got two years, two genuine full-time jobs with full-time paychecks, uh, and applied again the next year. And two years of work experience. And he turned me down again. And I was pretty upset. I said, I have the two years of work experience. And that's where persistence comes in. I applied to Carnegie Mellon Business School too. I got in. They started Labor Day. Stanford started later in September. And what I did was talk to everybody in the admissions office. And this is the persistence part. And kept talking to them and frankly with friends with everybody in the admissions office except the admissions director. <laughs> so I literally kept track of how many candidates were given admissions offers, how many accepted, how many changed their mind. I, I knew all the stats by talking to everybody in the admissions office. Uh, come Labor Day, I kept hounding the admissions director to let me in. And you know, he had eventually, after rejecting me, said, fine, I'll put you on the wait list, which was his way to try and get rid of me. But, okay. Um, and since I was on the wait list, I kept talking to him probably every two or three weeks and hounding him. I didn't give up. Labor Day came. I started in the business school at Carnegie. Uh, but I didn't still give up, and I kept talking to the admissions office, and then Three or four days before classes started, one of, the, one of the women's in the admissions office called me and said, hey, this other kid just dropped out of the class. He was supposed to start uh, you know, uh, uh, on Tuesday, Tuesday, and this was like Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so I called the admissions director. I hear somebody's dropping out. I'm coming. I didn't tell him I wanted. I told him I'm coming. And literally got on a plane on Wednesday. I paid my rent, which I didn't have spare money for. Uh, I had money for my house and my uh, tuition, my apartment and tuition fees. I just showed up. I had very little money in my bank account. I just showed up. Uh, and he let me in. This woman put me in a, on a couch as, as housing because I literally had no money to pay for the deposit. I did get a job. Mm -hmm. McDonald's was really valuable then. <laughs> make for make meals. And then something, you know, lucky happened. I was going down Galvez Street. I stopped at the traffic light next to El Camino. Somebody came up and hit me in the back of my car. And I called the insurance company, I'd say, I said, I'd take half the payout if you give it to me immediately. And that was sufficient to get me going. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a deal with the insurance company, got cash quick, got a job, and managed through. So persistence matters, and not giving up during those hard times, and entrepreneurship really matters a lot. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>